Hello, welcome back. Now let's take a look at step by step how you go about and actually buying and selling bonds as part of your investment portfolio. If you're buying a newly issued bond, uh, you typically will pay the face value unless you say zero coupon bond like the T bills that we talked about. Uh, you can buy newly issued U.S. government bonds, treasuries. Remember the term; that's very important to 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 keep in mind. You can buy those and savings bond directly from Treasury Direct. The only downside buying from Treasury Direct is that the website is quite difficult to navigate. It is not the most user friendly website, but you will be guaranteed that you are purchasing the bond directly from the U.S. government, and also there's no commission. Uh, you can also buy any bonds, including treasuries, um, from brokerage firms. Um, a lot of brokerage firms, not all, but a lot of brokerage firms offer to uh, sell treasuries, particularly original issued treasury, meaning new treasuries with no commission. If you are not buying new bonds, if you buy an existing bonds, uh, you can you can buy it at the secondary market, and you have to buy it from a brokerage firm. If you buy the bond and hold on to them until they mature, you don't have to do anything. The principal will automatically be deposited into your account and you are all set. However, if you need money ahead of the maturity day, then you have to sell it in the secondary market. So if you're selling your bond before the maturity day, uh, you will you have to use a brokerage firm and you sell it to either another investors or back to the brokerage firm itself. One thing to keep in mind if you end up having to sell a bond ahead of the maturity date is the liquidity of the bond. A lot of corporate bonds are not liquid. And that means that you, when you need the, if you need to sell it before its maturity day, it may take a while for you to sell the bond and you may have to, get, you may have to lower the price in order to, um, to sell it. Uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, are very liquid. Uh, if you need to sell a treasury ahead of time, that usually is not a problem. There's a huge secondary market for U.S. Treasuries. A final note about brokerage firms. Brokerage firms, uh, in addition to just bringing buyers and sellers together, they also act as dealers. Uh, what that means is the brokerage firms are selling the bonds from the infantry to you, the investor, or they, when they buy the bond, they'll buy it from an investor and put them into their infantry. Think of it as a used car dealer who, who buy cars or take cars from trade-ins, and then they'll sell the used cars back to another consumer. Uh, the, the thing that you want to keep in mind is that when a brokerage firm acts as a dealer, they make money two ways. First, they make money through the commission they did charge, and they also make money in the difference between the buy and sell price. So obviously, if you're working with a used car dealer, you know that you sell the, the price you, you get from selling the car is very different from the price that the car dealer is selling it to another customer. Uh, the difference between the buy-sell price is called the bid-ask spread. So that's another way for um, a brokerage firm to generate revenue. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just important to be aware of uh, where the fees and the revenues comes from. So now let's say you're ready to buy some bonds. So what do you need to know? First thing is that if you're buying a bond that is currently outstanding, and that's very common because when you're ready to buy a bond, it's unlikely that a new bond just happened to be available. Again, exception is the treasuries because the U.S. government issues new bonds on a very regular basis. So if you want to buy um, treasuries, you can usually be, you also usually be able to get new treasuries. Uh, but if you're buying an outstanding bond, um, and there are many reasons to do that because treasuries, they have pre-specified maturity date. So if you buy a new treasury, it may be a 30 year, but you don't want 30 year, you only want say, 25 years and there's no treasury being sold for 25 years, you go and buy an existing treasury to have 25 years left on its maturity. So that's a perfectly valid reason to buy outstanding bonds and there's nothing wrong with that. However, you need to uh, be aware that uh, the day that you purchase the bond, they are likely, it is likely to be a, a day that is not directly on a coupon payment date. And so in that case, the buyer 
whoever is buying the bond, we have to pay the, pay the seller for what we call accrued interest. One way to think of accrued interest is that this is unpaid interest. So remember that a lot of times interest is paid every six months. So let's say you buy the bond um, two months after the last interest is paid. So now the seller of the bond has, hold on, has held on to the bond for two months without getting paid. And you come in and buy the bond and you only have to hold on to it for four months and you get the full six months worth of interest. So that, that obviously is not fair. So you have to give the seller the unpaid interest, so the the part the portion of the interest that you will be getting at the end of the six at the end of the six months to them. Another thing to keep in mind is the difference between a bid and an ask quote. So that determines the price of the bond. So uh, the terminology can be a little bit confusing. If you are selling a bond, you receive the bid price. If you are buying a bond. You have to pay the ask price. So just remember that you're when you're buying, you pay the ask price. When you're selling, you receive the bid price. So if you are buying a bond, this is what how much you have to pay. You take the ask price because you are you're buying. So this is a buyer. So you take the ask price. So this is how much you pay for the face value of the bond. And you have to pay the accrued interest to the seller. And you also have to pay the commission. So this is the total amount you pay by a seller, if, uh, by the buyer, sorry. If you are the seller, the amount that you receive is based on the bid price because that's what you, are, what you get as a seller. And then you also receive the accrued interest from the seller and you have to subtract the commission that you pay to the brokerage firm. Another thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes bonds have minimum purchase requirement. So if you don't meet the minimum purchase requirement, um, a better alternative would be to use mutual funds. Uh, for bonds, however, treasuries, the minimum is not too high. So a lot of individual investors will be able to buy treasuries uh, on their own. Let's say you are ready to buy. So you go to a brokerage website and you select a bond. Let's take a look at the different elements. Now, this is a corporate bond. Treasury bonds are a lot simpler. Again, treasury bonds just have different maturity day and different coupon rate. Um, but the basic idea is very similar. This is the total name of this particular bond and it has multiple uh, components. The first is the name of the, of, the, of the association or the organization that issues the bond. In this case, that is KeyBank. Uh, the second tells you a little bit more about this bond. This is S SUB stands for subordinate. So this is a subordinated note. Subordinated means that it is not the first in line. Subordinated means below something. So this is uh, in case of bankruptcy, this note will get paid after other more senior notes have been paid first. So this is a subordinated. So this is very important. This, this every single uh, abbreviation <laughs> convey a lot of information. So that's the seniority. Uh, next is the coupon rate. So coupon rate is 3.9%. And then the maturity year. So this is 2029. So that is this entire term is the name of the bond. It also tells you whether or not it is callable. So in this case, it is callable. Uh, and it's conditional, meaning that there are things that you need to satisfy. Another thing that is important is, let's say you decided on this bond, uh, all bonds has a unique ID. Uh, this is called QSIP. You'll see this uh, referred to again later. So this is a combination uh, identifier. Um, again, every single bond is unique. So uh, by using this, this number, the QSIP, you can look up more information about any given bond. 
So in here, you can see um, a lot of other information. Once again, the coupon rate is 3.9%. Notice that they omit the percentage in the display here. And the maturity day is April 13, 2029. So as included in the name of the bond, it gets paid semi-annually. So we talk about that. Here, this is the bond rating. So here they have two rating agency uh, rated this bond. One is Moody's. Moody give you a BAA1 and S&P give you a triple B plus. So this is not a very safe bond. It is not in the junk or high yield status, but it's just one step above it. Um, so if it tells you the how much you can buy in terms of the quantity. The smallest quantity is 250. So it does have a minimum purchase requirement. And the most you can buy is 375. Uh, we enter 300 here just as an example. So the price of the bond, remember we talked about that, that is quoted as a percentage. So it's entering 84.005% of the face value. Uh, so if you buy 300 bonds, the face value is 300,000. So that means the face value per bond is 100,000. If you take the face value times the price, notice that it's assumed you divide it by 100 because the price is assumed to be a percentage, even though it's not written as such. So that's some of the um, subtleties that we talked about um, earlier. We also, uh, and then there is accrued interest. We talk about that. That's how much interest ha has accrued. Uh, the number of days and 109 days. Uh, and then the commission to buy this bond is 250. So the total transaction amount is equal to the face value. So, so the, the price. So if face value times the price plus the accrued interest plus the commission and those three add together give you the net amount. Notice here, there are many different types of yields, yield to verse, yield to maturity, yield to call, yield to sync. Let's see, what do this mean? Let's take a look. The yield to maturity is the return that you'll get if you buy the bond today at the price that was quoted and you hold on to the bond until it matures. That's why it's called yield to maturity. Yield to call is the return that you get if the bond gets called as soon as it becomes callable. So this is a bad scenario, but it may not be the worst. You to worst is the return you get if everything that can go wrong, go wrong, except the company does not default. Because if the company defaults, your return will be negative. <laughs> um, so, uh, so these are different scenarios. And you to sync is a return if you're the unlucky investor and your bond gets called to be redeemed uh, as part of the sinking fund at the next re redeemable rate. So this represents different scenarios. So when you buy bonds, you can this give you a sense of what are what can you expect under different scenarios? What is your return gonna be? Uh, another yield that is oftentimes quoted is called the current yield. The current yield is just an approximation for the yield to maturity. In the old days, it is quite difficult to compute yield to maturity, so a lot of bond companies use current yield as an approximation. Nowadays, um, all bond quotation will include yield to maturity. However, be aware that if you buy the bond and you don't hold on to it until you mature, your actual return could be very different. And your actual return is sometimes called a holding period return. So let's take a look at what can you expect when you buy a bond? What are your returns? You get two types of cash flow. The first is the coupon component. This is the coupon payment that you get on the scheduled coupon payment day. And you may, and then when the bond, another component is the capital loss or gain. If you hold onto the bond until you mature, then the difference between the face value and the price you pay for the bond would be your capital gain or loss. Now, if you bought the bond at ISU 
at the par value or the face value, then you'll have zero capital gain or loss. Um, but if you buy the bond after it has been issued, then the price you pay will be different from the face value. If the bond is sold before maturity, then the capital gain is simply the difference between your selling price and your purchase price. If the bond is called before maturity, then the capital gain or loss is the difference between the call price and the price you pay for the bond. The reason we distinguish different types of return is because there are different tax implications. Coupon payments are taxed as ordinary income, and if you have purchased the bond and held onto it for more than a year, then the capital gain uh, will be taxed at a capital gains rate. So remember that for um, Municipal bonds, the coupon payments are tax exempt. There are three main types of risks associated with investing in bonds. The first is default risk. This is the risk that a company will go bankrupt and unable to pay its interest and principal. Uh, bond rating is usually the best indicator of the risk. So a AAA bond will have a much lower risk of defaulting than a uh, high yield bond or a B bond. It's not a AAA bond does not mean that it's completely safe, it just means that it is less risky. Another risk is call risk. We already talked about this. Um, the reason why it is considered a risk is because a company will only call a bond if interest rate has decreased and that is to their advantage. Um, you will get the call price, but then now you will have to buy new investments and that will have a lower return because interest rate has gone down. So since the call option is advantageous to the company, it is disadvantageous to the investor. The last type of risk is an interest rate risk. This, is, this risk affects investors if they end up having to sell the bond before it matures. The reason for that is because bond prices goes down when interest rate goes up and vice versa. So if the interest rate goes down, bond prices goes up, you can sell the bond and get a higher price. But now the money will be invested at a lower return. Um, so, but if you are forced to sell a bond before you matures, then you may end up having to sell a lower price if interest rate has gone up. So what is the best way to manage the risk of investing in bonds? The best way to incorporate bonds into your investment plan or your financial plan is to match the maturity. So we call this maturity matching. So the so the, to do maturity matching, you find bonds that match your future cash flow needs. So this strategy minimizes your interest rate risk. So let's take a look at example. Let's say you need you plan to buy a house in a year and you have saved up twenty thousand dollars and you want to make sure that you have that $20,000 available to you when you're ready to buy the house, you can buy a 52-week T-bill. Another option is to do bond lettering. Lettering here means you're gonna buy different bonds at different maturity. So the term may sound a little bit weird, uh, but it's actually very simple. So you create a bond portfolio. Remember, portfolio just means you have more than one bond. So you buy different bonds, and each one has a, or each group of bonds have different maturity. And this strategy will require a little bit more money because you need to have enough money to buy the different types of bonds. However, if you are you have rich retirement or you're giving advice to someone who is has rich retirement this is a pretty good strategy so say someone has retired and they have saved up a lot of money what they want now is to make sure that the money they have saved can support them in retirement so you can then divide create a portfolio with some two-year bonds some three-year bonds some five-year bonds for example and when you do that then the next two years living expense will be supported by the two-year bond, and then the following year will be supported by the three-year bond, and so forth. So this is a very common retirement investment strategy. I know there's a lot to take in, but you also learn a lot. Uh, we'll stop the video here. Uh, the next video is an advanced video, and feel free to skip over it. I'll, if I don't see you in the next video, I'll see you in the video about stock investing. See you soon.